Ohio is greatly resourced. And uh, I have the distinct uh, pleasure and honor of introducing to you a couple of our great resources. Uh, for many of uh, us, when we don't know information, uh, we uh, hit Google or, or Siri. Uh, for me, I call Kimberly Dent. <laughs> And uh, Ms. Uh, Dent is uh, the executive director of the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood. Uh, she has extensive experience uh, with policy, practice, law, surrounding some of the uh, elements that are necessary uh, to promote responsible fatherhood for non-residential uh, fathers. And uh, we've worked closely uh, regarding incarcerated dads, promoting um, ultimately better outcomes for children and uh, families in total. The other person on our stage is, uh, I call him that, that real guy. And uh, we uh, became acquainted back in 2013 when I served as a deputy warden at one of our correctional institutions. Yep. Mr. Carlos Christian uh, has extensive experience on both sides of the gate, being a father. Uh, he promotes fatherhood wherever he goes, and uh, I'm proud to say he is uh, the executive director, founder of the Starts Within Foundation, uh, which recently received funding, I believe, from the Commission on, on Fatherhood. And so these two great resources are going to share with you some information that's vital and key the, to the success of fathers uh, around this great state and increasingly um, their footprint reaches across the country. So without further ado, please welcome by round of applause, Director Dent and <laughs> Carlos Christian. Thanks, thanks. Thank you, thank you so much. Dr. Mike Davis, thank you. Smart and what Dr. Guy. Davis did not um, mention is he is one of my commissioners. So um, give him a round of applause. So thank right. you so much. <laughs> um, so we're going to kind of change things up a little bit because we did have an hour um, to do this. But again, um, Dr. Martinez's um, uh, presentation, nicely done. Thank you so much for that explanation because I think it's really gonna help a lot of us go back to our work with different lenses and maybe different strategies as well. Um, so I am again Kim Dent with the Commission on Fatherhood. Um, I'm going to get all of the sort of bureaucratic kind of explanation out of the way because I want to leave time for Mr. Carlos Christian to talk about how he um, basically dismantled his own um, school to prison uh, pipeline in his life and in his family to include his children. Um, so the Commission on Fatherhood, um, actually in your package, you have everything that you need to know really about the Commission on Fatherhood. Um, uh, there is a brochure. We are a state agency. Um, I am an Ohio Department of Job and Family Services employee. So we are uniquely positioned in um, ODJFS. My funding is TANF temporary assistance to needy families. Uh, most of the funding that I have are um, earmarked for me to um, fatherhood programs, uh, faith-based and nonprofit programs that work with low-income fathers and families. And so Talbert House folks, can you raise your hand? Mr. Harold Howard, Mr. Brent, yep. I don't know where Mr. Calvin Williams went, but um, <laughs> he's also one of the ones that works very closely with Talbert House. So Talbert House is one of the programs that I do fund in this area um, in Hamilton County. There are a lot of different charges and purposes of the Commission on Fatherhood. One of them is public speaking. I do a lot of engagement in Ohio, also outside of Ohio. Why? Because Ohio, being as unique and progressive as we are, we are the only state that has a fatherhood commission that is part of, um, yep. <laughs> Um, structured the way that we are structured. And so when I say structured that way, I have 20 commissioners who support me. I have all three branches of government. So I have six members of the General Assembly that are on the commission, um, two senators and four members of the House. Um, the governor has a designee on the commission. And I also have um, 
a designee from the Ohio Supreme Court. And then we have commissioners from the state um, departments like Rehabilitation and Corrections, Department of Youth, Mental Health and Addiction, Department of Health. And then also the governor appoints five members of the public. We do have two vacancies. So if anyone is interested in applying to be on the commission, um, there is an application on my website, which is at fatherhood.ohio.gov. Um, there's a lot of different um, tabs there, but if you click on the commissioner tab, you'll be able to meet our commissioners because there's photos of them, bios, and at the very bottom of that page is an application if someone is interested in becoming a commissioner. We meet five times a year um, in Columbus and we talk about issues like today. Um, a lot of uh, other things that I sort of focus on, which Dr. Davis mentioned, was um, policy. Policy makes sense policy that's father friendly and father inclusive. Why? Because when we're talking about fragile families, we have to, by default, talk about dad, right? And the supports and the resources that are there for him because typically they're not. So that's why um, I try and put as much of the budget as I possibly can into the services. But at the state level, I engage with a lot of other departments um, to talk about um, you know, changing some policies. And one of the major policies we did change recently um, was House Bill 166, which is how child support agencies are permitted to um, utilize the income of an incarcerated non-custodial parent. So child support agencies are no longer permitted to say this non-custodial parent who has a child support order and who is incarcerated, that that person is voluntarily unemployed or underemployed. They were able to do that, therefore imputing income. And so if an, if an incarcerated non-custodial parent's prison wages were $18, the child support agency could say, well, this person is voluntarily unemployed or underemployed, therefore we're not going to use that $18 per month, we're going to use minimum wage, or we're going to use what that person made before they were incarcerated because the crime they committed was voluntarily done by them, so therefore they are voluntarily unemployed, underemployed, no longer permitted to do that, okay? So I can go on about policy all day, and I'm not. If there's anything else you guys want to know um, about the Commission on Fatherhood, um, again, there's a lot of information in your packets, but I kind of want to turn it over and start to talk to Mr. Carlos Christian, um, because I think it's, it's really important for you all to actually talk with someone that sort of went through um, some of this community to prison pipeline and kind of where he is in his life today. Um, so, Mr. Carlos Christian, can I ask you to um, maybe talk to um, the audience about sort of what your childhood was like? Okay, so first of all, I, 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 I'm just so excited to be a part of this event and, and, and dismantling the, the community to prison pipeline it fits right along with, with the tagline that I had came up with too as well, which is turn the penitentiary on its head and stand the community on its feet. I've been pushing that for about four yes. years now, right? In a real way, in a real way. So just to talk about uh, a bit about, about my childhood and, and growing up, I grew up in a single parent household. My, my father raised me and my brother alongside with my grandmother. And my, my, my mother, she got caught up in the 80s. She got addicted to crack and, and she couldn't be there. So she ended up getting incarcerated for a few robberies and things like that. But I didn't know that she got incarcerated for robberies. I just knew that she wasn't there and my father was there, but my father was pretty cool. So yeah, I just had a good relationship with my father um, um, growing up when I, when I was young. And, 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 and when I was growing up, I, I can remember that I was exposed to an environment to where at 13 years old, I said that, you know what, hey, it's time to get busy because I seen a shortage of income inside of our household and, and my idea to be able to get to the next level was to be able just to get some money. So I said that I was going to go out there and start to sell drugs and that's what I committed myself to inside of my community was selling drugs because I was just thirsty to be able to see something different, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, so that's what I did. I, I committed myself to selling drugs at, at the age of 13. I started selling marijuana. And then by the summer of, 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 of eighth grade, I started to sell crack cocaine as well. Mm -hmm. 
So I was all the way committed because this is the information that my community gave me. By 19 years old, I got incarcerated to a 10-year prison sentence. So I was, I was sentenced to a 10-year prison sentence in Marion Correctional Institution. My son, I was a proud father at the time too because remember, I grew up with my father. I was a proud father. I had a three-month-old son when I got incarcerated. And I said that, man, wow, this is crazy. So now when I was incarcerated, I said that I had to do something different, right. you know, to be a father. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And so, um, and that's what's very impressive, I mean, for me, because we do a lot of, um, of our programming, the, the programs that, um, that the Commission on Fatherhood funds, they are actually in the prisons working with um, fathers um, to ensure that they keep that title um, when they go in. And so when I'm in the prisons, that's one of the, um, you know, conversations that we have with our incarcerated fathers is that when you came in here, you had that title of father. You're not stripped of that title. You did not give that title up, but it's up to you to um, sort of determine what it is that you're going to do. Um, I call that geography. So if you were deployed overseas, if you were in the military, you're not physically there, but you still have that title of father. So can you tell me what it is that you did while you were incarcerated to keep your title? Right. So when I, when, when I, when I um, founded the Starts Within organization, Starts Within says it starts within. That means it starts within you. It starts within your current situation. So at 19 years old, I said that, you know what, I'm about to attack the mentality that has gotten me incarcerated. So then that's where I went to as far as solving my problem of incarceration. I said that, man, this mentality that I was rocking with is not a mentality that I'm going to be able to use to raise my son because this is going to continue to separate me from my son or get me killed. And this is the, and, and, and so so with understanding that what I had to do is I had to start to just work on myself I started to develop myself I got into scripture first I didn't get raised in scripture at all so I got into scripture mm -hmm. al along with Bible study and TD Jakes every Thursday Potter house mm -hmm. I just got busy <laughs> I just allowed that scripture to saturate Absolutely. my mind and I started to develop a new way of thinking I started to believe in myself and who I was the contribution that I have to make to society but also to my son. Now, my son was the main reason mm -hmm. why I went out there mm -hmm. to get new information because I understood that the information that I had was bogus right. and it was circulating around in my community. And that's why I first went to scripture to be able to start to develop a new way of thinking so I can make a new, some, some new decisions and, and, and just get new results. And after that, I got into to college and I also mm -hmm. I graduated from Marion Technical College from uh, uh, business management with a 3.83 GPA. Yes. Woo. Yes. And then I got into administrative office technology and I learned the computers as well. So I got into that with vocational training and I graduated from that. I learned some Spanish as well while I was incarcerated, <laughs> right? Because I was just trying to develop this individual that was going to be responsible enough to be able to lead my son in the right way. And I knew that I could not lead my son in the right way if I wasn't leading myself in the right way. So I said that, hold up, I done led myself in a position a place where I am getting counted six times a day in a place where these conditions is adverse it is no way that I can be responsible enough to be able to lead my son in the right way so then that's why I just attack that mentality by getting new information mm -hmm. so I can successfully lead my son and then after I got that information mm -hmm. right that's when I started to really just interacting with my son so we was able to get free uh, state letters that they would allow us to send home every week. So then they would provide you envelopes and stamps and, and, and you can send that free state letter home every week. I utilize those state letters to write my son once a week. So I said that, you know, while I'm inside, and I did this for my whole entire 10 years. Mm -hmm. That means that all the way from three months old till he was 10 mm -hmm. years old, I wrote him a letter once a week. Right, because I said that I know that I'm still dad, and, right. and, and, and nobody can take away me being a father. I have to literally give, give it, it away, away. Right. and I just wasn't willing to give it away. I just said that, man, yes. I just got yes. a, a strong desire. 
I just wasn't willing to give it away, you Absolutely. know. So, and because of that desire, uh, uh, something that I that's been operating uh, in my mind recently, is, uh, and it's, it's heavy. It's just that mm -hmm. the desire. It says that God gives us our desires, and I really truly believe that. I'm talking about He gives us what to desire, not saying that I desire a, a Bentley or a Rolls Royce, but He gives <laughs> us what to desire. He placed the desires in our heart, and then we chase those desires, right? Mm -hmm. So He's given me a desire to be a father he placed that in my heart and because he's given me that desire when I was incarcerated I just looked at different ways to be that best effective father that I can possibly be so then my son wouldn't grow up mm -hmm. and become an adult who was incarcerated so when I was incarcerated I said man I gotta do something about it right absolutely. and that's where the letters came into place yeah. staying in contact um, Halloween just passed for trick or treat. What I used to do is I used to send candy home for trick or treat. So I would go to the commissary, and people who don't know who the commissary, what the commissary is, commissary is like the store. Yeah. Right? Where <laughs> like you can get treats. Yeah. It's the corner, corner store. store. Yeah. It's the corner store. It's the corner store. The stuff is expensive too. Yeah. It's the corner store, right? <laughs> So I would get money in once a week for my father because my father was still present in, during my 10 year in prison since he was still supportive and he would bring my son up to visit me while I was incarcerated as well throughout the time. So I, 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 he would send me $20 in a week and I would take one of those weeks out of the month and I would just take that $20 and I would go get $20 worth of candy and I would use $15, well $15 worth of candy and I would use $5 to mail it home. And I would just sacrifice my my, my noodles and yes and my coffee. Yes. <laughs> your ramen, and they, oh, your yeah. ramen noodles. Yeah, yeah. Okay. all of the zoom zooms and wham whams, yeah, right? <laughs> so I sacrificed all right. of the zoom zooms and wham whams <laughs> because I said that I had to go ahead and 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 offer my son this sacrifice because that's what was going to build on the strong, positive relationship that I knew that I had to have with my son. Absolutely. So. And then actually to build on that story, so, so Carlos actually has two books as well, and we'll talk about those here at the very end. But one of the stories I love is when the candy came, comes to the, to the neighborhood, and so Little Los was like the man in the neighborhood, so when the UPS oh, yeah. truck pulls up, the friends know, candy, right? right? So now Lowe's has all of these friends. However, when, when mom gave the report about Lowe's not brushing right. his teeth, yes. then. Yes, yes. So, so well, the, the, the trucks was coming up and they was, they was seeing the, the trucks come up and little Carlos, he had, you know, when he gets a box of candy, everybody said, Carlos, he got to pack in, you know? <laughs> so everybody would always gravitate towards him, right? The kids and stuff, so he was the man. But he wasn't brushing his teeth. And when his mom told me that, I said, hold up. What you mean he ain't brushing his teeth? Man, this, this dental bill is about to be crazy. I said, okay, cool. And I told him, I said, son, man, I got something coming for you the next time in the mail, along with your letter and the card. But this time, I said, man, I'm going to send you the toothbrush and some toothpaste, and this is what you need to use, and then we'll go ahead and, and, and get back to On the track. candy Absolutely. after you get to brushing your teeth. Right. So. <laughs> right, yeah. and that's what we call the discipline, right? And right, so absolutely. from prison, and so yes, you can be a parent from prison. Also, can you tell them a little bit about the reading? Um, right. We talk about oh, educating yeah. and how absolutely. important dads are um, to their children's education. Absolutely, so one of the reasons why I was sending him the, the, the letters from prison and I, and I had him, I skipped the lines, all capital letters, so his mom could read the letters alongside with him so he can start to get better in his reading. But when I did get released from prison, mm -hmm. my son had a second grade reading level in mm -hmm. the fifth grade, right? And I just wondered, how did he get just passed through all of these grades with this second grade reading mm -hmm. level? And he, and, and he was just passing his grades. Mm -hmm. And he was in the fifth grade when I had came home. And right. he was getting into trouble in school too as well because when you have difficulty with reading, yes. now he's getting into fights. You know, so this was what was happening when I came home. And he had started to develop a certain fondness with the, the, 
the streets, you know, because of his cousins that he was connected to. Now, he's 10 years old when I came home, mm -hmm. and, and I was 29 at the time, and I said that, well, it's time to step it up another notch, and I just had to really get involved. Now, his mom, because of what I was doing when I was incarcerated, she says that, you know what, I trust you with the development of our son because of the development of you. Because I did tell her, Exio mucho, pero traigo mucho, a la mesa. She said, brother, you know Spanish. You a well wide rounded brother. I said, that's cool. She said, she said, <laughs> yes. That's so, the only, that's what, the only phrase you that's know, right? Right, yeah, okay, I yeah. keep on saying, right, that's my only phrase that I know right now. I can break it down with the Spanish. I'm so rusty, so don't test me with my Spanish, right? Because I don't use it so that you don't use it, you lose, lose it. it. yeah. But, 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 but his mom said that, you know what, I'm going to give you residential custody of our son so you can raise him to be a man, and I was able to really influence him in the right way and raise up that reading level too as well, which was phenomenal. Right, absolutely. And that's why, yep, so thank you, yes, big applause. And so the Commission on Fatherhood uh, programs that we fund, that's exactly what it is that we're looking for. So there are three different components that um, our programs, Talbert House, I did mention Talbert House, Mr. Calvin Williams, but you did walk out of the room. So there's another person that, that is very connected in this area, in the Hamilton County area. And I'm sorry, Carol, you're serving Hamilton, Butler, and Warren. Got it, okay. Oh, and there's a map in, in here as well to tell you exactly where the programs are, are serving. But the three components that we do want our programs to um, provide to low-income fathers and families are parenting skills, right. okay, right. Um, through evidence-based fatherhood curriculum, um, uh, co-parenting and healthy relationship skills. Um, Talbert House is actually one of our um, programs that um, experienced early on the importance of um, ensuring that after we give dads good parenting skills, they come to these weekly cohorts of learning the type of father that they want to be. Um, how do I now pick that up and work it out with her? And that's not always the easiest thing to do. Um, a lot of uh, times, and you know, again, especially with my background being in child support, um, it's it's really. Um, sad and, and terrifying how children are brought into the world um, where folks don't know one another. Um, I've talked to many women in my caseload working at Franklin County Child Support that really didn't know his government name, knew his nickname, didn't know his last name, didn't know his family, didn't know where he was from, couldn't really tell me anything, but you guys have a common child. Um, you don't have, you know, you don't know what his goals are, he doesn't know what your goals are, what your ambitions are, your ethics, your morals, you know, you know, you know what you affiliate yourself with. But again, there's a common child. So how do we bring those two people together um, in the best interest of the child. And then the third um, component is always going to, of course, be economic stability. And it's not always just about um, obtaining a job. We didn't have problems getting dad's jobs, especially in Ohio. Um, it was maintaining the job. If we have issues like addiction, alcoholism, or mental health, um, and we put someone into employment, more times than not, three, four weeks later, they're not going to be there because we did not address the issues that are going on up front. Um, and so, um, Mr. Carlos Christian, um, if you can tell me a little bit about like, what you had to do when you came back to your community in order to ensure that you and your son were successful with your reentry. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the first thing that I had to do is I, I had to get employed. So then that was the main thing. That was the first thing that I did when I came home. Now, I, I just told y'all all of the things that I had on, on my jacket. I told you I had a 3.83 GPA of uh, business management. I told y'all some XEO, mucho pedo, trigo, mucho a la mesa. <laughs> right, gifted. But one of the things that was difficult was getting employment, right? So I was going to fill out these applications and I was getting denied 
back to back, deny, deny, deny. And, and one of the things that helped me was just the relationships. So it was actually a case manager that mm -hmm. was in the halfway house that I was that I was at when I got released who says that go on to the west side of Cleveland and that person over there actually is connected with me. I've known him since childhood. He owns his own business and that's how I was able to get employed. Now, <clears throat> that employment, it was $6.85 an hour, but I said that I, I was going to work it like it was $40 an hour, right? And by doing that, guess what I did? I was able to establish strong relationships mm -hmm. inside of that, em, 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 with, with that employer and my other co-workers. And then when my other co-workers went to different jobs and they established the strong relationships with their supervisors, they reached back to me and said, Carlos, come on with me. I got a connection with the supervisor that will be able to overlook your background check because I'm going to give them your information and let them know that you are good people, you are a good employee, and you will benefit their company. So then that's how my background check was relevant and my right now check was everything. Right, absolutely. And then you also had to leave the community as right. well. And I left the community. So then I ended up leaving from Cleveland, Ohio, and I moved to Columbus, mm -hmm. where I like to call the land of milk and honey. I just love every bit of it, right? It's like all things are possible in Columbus. So, <laughs> so I left from Cleveland <laughs> to Columbus, and that's when I just started to really get heavily involved with my son, who was mm -hmm. staying in Columbus mm -hmm. at the time. And that's when it was just time to rock and roll. But I had got employed down here in Columbus as well. And the common denominator between it all was strong relationships. So then that means that relationships was in place for me to get the employment in Columbus, right. but also the desire to establish that strong relationship with my son is what kept me focused and on that path that I needed to be on so I didn't go back into that same old way of thinking absolutely. that got me incarcerated. In yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so now with the Commission on Fatherhood, and I'm not even going to talk up because I don't know everything that you're doing and everyone that you're contracted with. I know that you're doing work with ODYS. So, so he is doing work with the Department of Youth Services um, with their Second Chance yeah, grant. Yeah. Oh, so he's in Circleville yeah. talking to young fathers who are um, incarcerated. Um, he's also a facilitator of a, the Father Factor, which is a father, an evidence-based fatherhood um, curriculum um, for um, Action for Children, right. one of the programs programs that the Commission on Fatherhood is funding. Um, he's also is doing work with ODRC, yeah, right? Absolutely. Contract absolutely. with them. Also with the Bureau of Prisons, the Federal yeah, Bureau oh, of Prisons. I, I, I sound like right. I'm reminding you right. what oh, you're doing. Right. 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 You're doing right. this, you're doing that. Right. Um, we also purchase his books. So whenever um, fathers who are in our programs in the um, institutions um, graduate from the fatherhood program, we um, actually give um, them Carlos's first book. And it, again, is about parenting from prison. And then the second one is more for the reentry right, um, father, um, how to be successful in reentry. Right. Um, another thing that you're doing um, is your documentary. Oh, so yes. if you can tell folks how to get your documentary as okay. well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the documentary. But that is huge with, with the book as far as with, with Kim, the, the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood. They actually purchased the books that I have written. I've written two books, Prison Without Bars, It Starts Within, and that's just the mentality mm -hmm. that got me incarcerated. And how did mm -hmm. I attack that mentality? How did I overcome it? The challenges that I faced in overcoming that mentality? Like, it's a step-by-step thing, a point A to point B, so people can know what direction to take to abandon the mentality. And, and, the, and the walking logo is everything that I had to do to support that mentality mm -hmm. that I had, um, that I had got, the, the new mentality that right. I had developed. And, and, and the father, I had just had a father that inboxed me yeah. from um, um, L-O-R-C-I. Yep. Because we had, because every year now, this is the second year, second year. where uh -huh. it's a statewide, no, it's not a statewide, but it's, it's, it's a, um, a institutional-wide fatherhood, uh, fatherhood conference. conference. Yeah. Last year it was 200, but this year it was 300, right? 300 fathers who are just now entering the penal system. They are just fresh in, and now they are getting into this fatherhood conference. But what Kim and the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood did is she bought everybody a book. So now everybody in that program had a Prison Without Bars book. 
Now, why is that so important? Because a lot of times these fathers don't, men don't know how to be because we didn't come up in an environment that taught us how to be in a way to where we will not get incarcerated or killed. So now when you are reading the book mm -hmm. or you are coming in contact with individuals who show you how to do life, now you can do life like that person who is showing you how mm -hmm. to do life. And that is just phenomenal. And it's that type of support that has happened throughout the state, whether it be inside of the, 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 the correctional facility in DYS, going inside doing the parenting programs inside of the, the DYS when you have a 15-year-old who mm -hmm. has a two-year-old child. Right. You know, a 15-year-old who has a three-year-old child. Mm -hmm. You know, and they are responsible for the development of an actual individual. Now, we could get them to get on track right. by their desire to be a father. And that's the one thing that we can tap in to with, the, with this population is their desire to be a father. Nobody wants to be labeled as a deadbeat dad. All of the people that you see that might not be involved in their children's lives, mm -hmm. they will always come with an excuse. Nobody is ever going to come most time, more times than not. They are not going to come and say, you know what, I just ain't, I'm just not no dad and I don't care about it. Usually they will come up with an excuse and say, man, the mother won't let me see mm -hmm. my child or, you know, is this and that. They will come up with an excuse. Well, what we do mm -hmm. with the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood starts within we eliminate that excuse. Right, absolutely. And so my passion, my passion for this work is of course I'm not a father, <laughs> but um, I didn't have a father. And um, my dad passed away the day before I turned five years old. And from that moment forward, I did not have not one strong male role model in my life. I was, came from a very strong maternal um, background. My mom, my grandmother, my aunties, very strong African-American women, really focused on education, so forth and so on. But this piece was missing for me. A lot of horrible um, choices in life, two failed marriages, Again, feeling my way through, what does this male, strong male look like? What, it's, what is it supposed to be like? So forth and so on. Um, there's something in your packets called the um, father absence crisis. There's my passion there. Um, sometimes this stuff keeps me up at night, honestly. Um, when dads are not involved or not there with the right tools, with the support, with the strength, with the knowledge, um, with strong foundations, this is what happens with our children. Our children do not do well at all. So my second divorce, um, my ex and I, we were friends. So that's one thing. We did know each other, of course, and we were friends. But when we decided that the marriage was not going to go forward, we sat down and we talked about our children. Um, our youngest son was five at the time, RJ. Um, and um, I told him, I don't care what the divorce decree says about your parenting time. You know you see your kids whatever you want. This is your home as well, right? They're here so you can be here. And when they're with you, I know that they're going to be okay. So we don't even have to have that conversation about par parenting time, partial parent, 50% shared parenting, whatever. Um, because we knew that our daughters and our son was not going to become a statistic of father absence. So um, we co-parented, and I, one of my staff, um, she likes to say we're like the poster children, like we should have like a poster of co-parenting. And it's not easy, don't get me wrong, it's not easy, but we love our children more than we dislike the situation we had with one another. And when you get there, that's when we know our kids are going to be okay. So RJ was five when we um, divorced, and then um, a couple of months ago in August, we piled into a vehicle, drove up to Great Lakes, Illinois, and together we watched him graduate from boot camp at, you know, at um, the Navy. So he's in the Navy, and yeah, thank you. <laughs> and so just like his high school graduation, when he looked out, he saw his family. He saw his mom and dad. We were divorced when he was five, and that's what he was used to. And he will continue to see his family in that way. That's his mom, that's his dad, and that's why he did so well. And so when I listened to Dr. Martinez, um, and I thought that this was really important for you all to hear, as Dr. Davis says, the, the real 
the real deal, the real cat, <laughs> that actually, um, you know, kind of started in this community. Um, and what he did as a father to ensure that his children, um, yes, actually have um, a chance. Now, he has two sons right. and a daughter. Yeah. Three-year-old, we talked about three-year-olds, little tiny toes. And I think she's kind of frying your brain a little bit. She's a little different. We were talking about the difference between boys and girls. But yeah, but um, some of the things. So we also have a Twitter and a Facebook page. And would love for you guys to follow our Twitter um, at the Commission on Fatherhood, also ODJFS. But there is a video out there um, that we, I asked our communications folks, we have to put this out here. Because these things are very meaningful. So we talked about young Los, Carlos. I can't even call him little Los because he's taller than you. Okay, so young Los um, and, and not brushing his teeth, eating the candy, um, and how you kind of disciplined him with getting the toothbrush rather than the candy. Now, there's a video on our Twitter page and our Facebook page um, of him <laughs> racing his three-year-old, every morning they have a competition of brushing teeth. And it is the cutest thing that you would ever want to look at um, you know, on, on social media, which I don't do. I don't have social media at all. So I'm like one of those anomalies. I don't have a social media page myself. But just to look at, you know, because Los is in his 20s, yeah. but then his three-year-old daughter and just the impact that he's making on this young girl who's yeah, probably going to be like you know one of the most um confident young ladies right. with the prettiest teeth i told her I, like hashtag future right. dentist it is crazy it's, it's a, a three-year-old right. and most of the times we're holding down three-year-olds right. trying to brush their teeth because they're so rebellious um and so i just felt it was really really important to um just ensure that you guys had an opportunity to hear from carlos christian who kind of walked this life and what he is doing now um you know, to give back right, in what absolutely. you're doing with, with your, your um, children as well. And so with the Commission on Fatherhood, again, um, we were blessed enough to get our, our budget more than doubled. I am part of the, the state budget. And every year, I operated on a million dollars. So I took this seat as the um, executive director in 2012. I did not apply for it, but someone was talking about what your, your destiny is and where God needs you to be. Um, and so I never would have thought, coming out of my child support background, that I would be executive director of the Commission on Fatherhood. But I understand now why I'm here and why I need to be here. Because when I worked at the county level, um, I had over 900 families in my caseload. That was my caseload alone. And the squeaky wheel always got the oil because there was no way I could humanly possible, possibly work um, 900 plus cases myself. And so I always knew the phone calls would come in, Miss Dent, where's my payment? Miss Dent, I promise I'm looking for a job. Please don't suspend my driver's license. Miss Dent, where's my payment? And so this back and forth with the custodial parent and the non-custodial parent, I knew somewhere in the middle there's a child or some children. And I never had an opportunity to really talk about those children because I was a child support caseworker. Um, after um, I received my master's degree, I said, you know, this is just crazy. I mean, you know, I'm at the county level. We're doing a lot of this chasing um, of parents who can't pay and, and of, of fragile families, these women who are raising these children that need the payment. So um, I went into the, the uh, state office of child support and we worked on doing some changes there, worked on policy. And that's when it clicked for me. The boots on the ground work that you guys are doing, that Talbert House is doing, you know, action for children, passages, forever dads. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's work that is so appreciated by me, and I, I just can't even tell you all just how thankful I am for the everyday work that you do. But my job at the state level, and I, even at the federal level, um, is to ensure that we don't have policies and procedures and processes in place that tie your hands or that hinder you from doing um, the work and from advancing our families out of poverty and, and to help our fragile families. And so um, we proudly, again, sit with a lot of um, different departments to ensure that our policy makes sense, again, and that it's going to ensure that our, our programs um, are able to help um, with um, you know, being the best parents, partners, and providers that, that they actually can be. Ohio, again, being very unique as we, as we are, very progressive, um, we have a practitioner's network for fathers and families. I don't make a move without these guys. Um, so we talk about relationships, right? Um, 
being a female, I know what is needed like for our children, but a lot of times I have to hear from them as fathers and as those in, in the, the business. And so the Ohio Practitioners Network for Fathers and Families, we have the president here who just called me out on it, um, <laughs> Mr. Harold Howard, um, and a past president, Mr. Calvin Williams, um, they kind of walk alongside me um, to ensure that I am going down the right path um, it, with engaging fathers to ensure that they um, can be there um, the best way that they can be for their children. Um, we also um, do a state fatherhood summit together. We do have a fatherhood summit coming up in t uh, May 20th and 21st of 2020. It is a free summit in Columbus. Um, as a state agency, we have a lot of sh we must do's. Every four years, the Commission on Fatherhood must do a, a state um, summit or a state conference. And the last one we had was in 2016. And so this one will be um, May 20th and 21st of 2020. And I partner with OPNFF because, again, I don't do too much without kind of plugging in to these um, young men. And I think that you are now going to be hopefully part of uh, OPNFF. He, he's going to get like initiated over there later or something. Prick your finger or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> yes. And so. Um, and OPNFF was actually um, started when the Commission on Fatherhood was defunded. We were not decommissioned, we were defunded. So the Commission on Fatherhood actually started in statute in 1999. And coming out the gate, there was this, um, I guess, this uh, view of, oh my gosh, this commission is going to be able to utilize $10 million. Well, you can't just give a brand new agency or a commission $10 million and say go forth and do, because there's a lot of planning. They didn't even have an executive director. So not, needless to say, they, they weren't able to spend all of the money. Um, and about two years after it started in 99, they pulled all the money back. So the commission did not get any money out of the state budget. Um, and so the OPNFF um, folks did not want to see a lot of the work or sort of that fatherhood buzz kind of fizzle in Ohio, and that's when um, OPNFF was formed. And they sort of carried, in my eyes, the torch for fathers in Ohio um, to continue. And then when Strickland became um, governor, he gave new life to the commission and, and provided more money to the commission. Um, and we operated on a million dollars a year until t um, uh, Governor DeWine and our g new General Assembly doubled my budget. So I'm very thankful to Governor DeWine as well as to my General Assembly um, um, Representative Riordan McLean and Representative Todd Smith and Representative Thomas West. Um, they talked to me um, you know, while the budget was still kind of moving through the process last year and I said at some point I'm going to just be paying salaries and doing some small little work with a million dollars. We need to get upstream and start doing more prevention work and early intervention work, and I need more funds to do that. And so I asked, and I actually received it. So I'm very, very thankful and grateful um, to them for that. So that allows me to do more intervention and early um, uh, uh, prevention and early intervention. Because the programs that I am funding, I call that reactive fatherhood programming. Um, so a lot of my programs like Talbert House, they're working with fathers who have already experienced that journey of dad, tens of thousands of dollars in child support debt, felony charges, um, no relationship with the child because of mom, you know, uh, no relationship with mom. Um, and so they come into Talbert House and we're putting out a lot of fires and we're trying to help dads. My thing is, is if we get upstream and we do more of this prevention, prevention of premature fatherhood or early intervention when dad becomes a father of an infant, we could possibly negate some of the things that our dads are experiencing when their, their kids are older. So um, I get very grateful to them for that and grateful to OPNFF. Thank you gentlemen over there and hope to see you guys um, at uh, the summit. We are expecting at least 200 people or so and we will um, send out announcements when we're ready for registration. Please put your email address on our webpage. Again, fatherhood.ohio.gov. If you put your email address in there, sign up to receive mailings from us. You will receive everything that we have to tell the state of Ohio from the Commission on Fatherhood. Thank you so much, Mr. Carlos Christian, for telling your story. And I just want to just, uh, just talk to, directly to you, Dr. Martinez. It was good that you had touched on about the about about how the schools they 
they, they make it more severe about the behavior that some of these children are exhibiting, you know, and then they get them out of the school. I've witnessed that. So I've seen that with my son, my 11-year-old. They try to say that he's, he's out of control. And then I go down there and I say, hold up, man, you have a negative relationship because you're trying to dominate him and he's asking you questions. And then they coming back to me and they saying, wow, this is crazy. And it changed the whole direction of his schooling. So having a father in place is so both parents in place is so important Crucial. to be able to really dismantle this 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 prison this 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 community the prison pipeline so mm -hmm. All of the work that everybody's doing, I appreciate everybody for, for making this something that is necessary for you to be involved in. We appreciate you and, and the families appreciate you. Okay? So right. thank you. Thank good. you. All right.